Mr. Borla, can I ask you, when did you know that the vaccines didn't stop transmission? How long did you know that without saying it publicly? Thank you very much. Why would I'm sorry. To that question. I mean, we, we now know that the vaccines didn't stop transmission, but why did you keep it secret? You said it was 100% effective, then 90%, then 80%, then 70%. But we now know that the vaccines do not trans stop transmission. Why did you keep that secret? Have a nice day. I won't have a nice day until I know the answer. Why did you keep it a secret that your vaccine did not stop transmission? That was Rebel News Ezra Levant questioning Pfizer CEO Albert Borla at the World Economic Forum last week. Quick caveat, Rebel News has faced criticism in the past for its reporting over the 2017 Charlottesville riots. However, that clip has gone viral. And on the issue of vaccine efficacy, Borla told CNBC's The Exchange back in 2021 that the vaccine's initial studies showed it protected people 100 percent of the time against hospitalization, but that it falls to low 90 percent and mid to a high 80% after six months. So I think that question was a perfectly valid question to ask the CEO of Pfizer. Um, the, the implication, the early implication being that the vaccines were not just helping with severe uh, illness and death, but also transmission that no longer holds up. And, you know, Pfizer got government contracts that are working to get the vaccine scheduled so it'll be protected from liability, possibly also required in some circumstances, schools and other things. Um, it, it seems like a worthwhile question to ask the CEO at this gathering of influential, wealthy people uh, from, from private business and from governments, et cetera, um, you know, the, the common man is not really allowed into Davos. So there you have a journalist, maybe a confrontational journalist, maybe one from an outlet that a lot of people don't like, but asking a question that I think is perfectly valid. And of course, he has nothing to say. Yeah, it was a, it was an absolutely valid question. Um, I, I he he asked it in a very polite way. I mean, this seems like the Canadian version of confrontational, right? <laughs> I will not be having a good day until you answer my question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just it was just I thought that that was just a great moment of journalism and really showed up the you know the cowardice his refuse you know the refusal of the CEO of Pfizer to answer the question. Um, you know, the point was made. The point was made, and it was made in a way that you know I think. I, again, you know, the theme of this show today has been a way that I really hope liberals, leftists, people who supported, you know, even Pfizer having, you know, protection from liability, let's say, because they thought it was so important, you know, Operation Warp Speed to get these vaccines out, you know, a moment that, you know, even people who maybe supported that could say, that is a question they should have to answer. That is a question they should have to answer perhaps before Congress. That is a question that the American people deserve an answer to. And... I absolutely agree with you. And it's so interesting that the theme, the central theme of Davos, which we talked about on the show a lot last week, um, was the the harm of disinformation. Um, I'm, I'm sure you paid attention to that that panel hosted by Brian Stelter, uh, whose former show on CNN, you and I have both been on it, uh, where he interviewed a number of people about the central harm of disinformation. And it, it, was, it was alarmist about how bad it is for society allowing people to say things that might be wrong or untrue or exaggerated on Facebook and on Twitter and on YouTube, and how, how we can't ever have society can't function until we fix that problem that was, they, they said all the other problems being discussed at Davos are linked to that problem and okay and here you have a question being put to someone uh, who, who who propagated a falsehood about the vaccines elites propagated that falsehood and that was just ended up being disinformation. And so they never turn this this disinformation framing on themselves and talk about all the way that the mainstream or the, the elite or the or the, the health officials in the government, how all of those people got things wrong. Not always, not everything they said was wrong, but sometimes it was wrong. And and how and the problems that caused. It's always framed as you, the person scrutinizing them, the things you got wrong or might have shared that were wrong. That's this disaster for society. But when we get things wrong, we, that's not worth talking about? Yeah, disinformation has become the new accusation of racism. The, the, the word elites use to silence scrutiny and criticism of 
what of the things that are in their economic interests, right? So you had A.G. Salzberger sitting there saying, you know, the biggest threat to, to media credibility is is uh, is disinformation, right? Couldn't possibly be that the biggest threat to the New York Times is credibility is anything the New York Times did to squander its credibility, right? It has to be some nefarious, evil external force that impugns the motives and the character of the people demanding accountability on behalf of powerful elites. You know, they always have to find a new way to silence critique ostensibly in the name of some higher virtue. And they seem to have found it here. And yes, you you guys did a great segment on, you know, this this uh, the woman who responded to Brian Stelter by saying, you know, I hope one day soon there it will be, you know, uh, misinformation and hate speech will be illegal in America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the, mm-hmm. the thing that, you know, I mean, on, honestly, I am sure a lot of our viewers are well aware of this. But, you know, this is, you know, this we don't call this the greatest country in the most free country on earth for nothing. You know, the thing that makes us so wildly above European countries is that we have a First Amendment. We very much value our freedom of expression, but our elites really don't. They really don't have the same yen and and heart for freedom of expression because it means it gives average people, regular, normal people, the right to talk back, the right to have their own opinions, the right to say, look, just because you're richer than me doesn't make you more right or give you the right to tell me how to live my life. Mm-hmm. And, and she, the person you're talking about who made that comment, the uh, the speech regulator on behalf of the European Union, if you listen to her full remarks, she was actually more kind of moderate or open-minded on the question of how much censorship is too much. Obviously, I would say (laughs) I I would draw that line way differently than her. But she was more uh, nuanced on the subject than the publisher of the New York Times. He was the most alarmed of all. He was the one very explicitly saying that, look, we need a, 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 a a regime where Facebook prioritizes content from places like, oh, maybe the New York Times instead of (laughs) others. And that's what we have to do. I I found that very telling. Yeah, it's telling and it's terrifying. And, you know, this handshake agreement, this sort of between, you know, the deep state, social media companies and liberal media outlets, uh, it's bad. It's really, really bad. And, you know, honestly, it makes you really think like, you know, so you take a place like the Daily Wire, right? And they're consistently ranked sort of highest. You you get get Facebook's top 10 stories every day. You know, Mm -hmm. seven of them are Ben Shapiro says this, Ben Shapiro says that. You imagine how much more reach he would have if all of these, you know, forces were not operating in order to try to limit it. I mean, there's just so much appetite among the American people for just normal points of view that they will not get from, you know, these more established liberal media outlets that have they have a very straightforward narrative and it's very clearly identified with one side of the political spectrum in America. I should mention, I did see two or three times over the last few days a, a something go viral on Twitter that was a screenshot of like a slide at the World Economic Forum or an alleged slide at the World Economic Forum or something on their agenda or something that people there believe that turned out to be that was fake. Um, so there, this is an issue and like people, please stop sharing. Like, please stop falling for fake content. Or if you accidentally share something that's fake, delete it. Um, because then like on the comments, on the replies, you have people after people saying, this is actually made up. And then I, some people say, well, it sounds like something they might think. You, you do not come off good when you do that. It, like, share, we can criticize the actual things these people think without like making up things. It's never, it's never a good look. So do be on, do be on the lookout you know, for some of that stuff. For misinformation, if you will. Yeah. Um, I, I will also say I, I'm sort of of the camp that, you know, this is sort of a distraction. I mean, you know, obviously it's delicious to pour over, you know, these elites exposing themselves and saying the quiet part out loud and admi- admitting, you know, the collusion between all of these like larger forces. But at the end of the day, I really don't feel that the World Economic Forum itself is having a deep impact on American public life. I think that our, you know, elites have way too much power, way too much political power and way too much money. Um, and they tend to go there. But, you know, if that whole organization organization sort of dropped into the ocean, we would still be having the same um, culture wars in America, the same battles, the same class divide. You know, it's more a symptom of our class divide than a cause. And I think a lot of people see it as sort of like a cause, you know, as, you know, some sort of like, you know, where they machinate and when they come up with like the ploy to how to hurt the working class. And it's like, no, that's all happening, you know, at a very individual level, often very unconsciously. And we can fight it at an individual level. You know, for example, um, you 
know, after disinformation, I noticed climate, of course, was like the number one topic you heard a lot about coming out of Davos. You know, the Republican legislators, even at the local level, have proven very powerful and adept at fighting more extremist um, climate agendas. And so that gives me a lot of hope. And I, I do see the kind of fo I hope when people focus on this and share this stuff, they're doing it in the spirit of like, gosh, look at these idiots and not in the spirit of, my God, they control everything, because I think that would be a little bit of a mistake. Mm. Wise words. All right, we'll have more rising right after this. Stay tuned.